Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. In the matchless name of Yahoshua Mashiach, this is Yahweh's servant, Reginald M. Graham. And we're delighted to be able to come to you once again with another message from the Word of Yahweh. This is Come Out of Her, My People broadcast with your host, Reginald M. Graham. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm just a voice crying in this end time wilderness, preparing the way of Yahweh, making straight paths for our Messiah, Yahoshua Mashiach. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations and then shall the end come. That verse is being fulfilled in your very ears on this day. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this broadcast is devoted, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to telling the truth. We don't apologize for the truth. If you are one that desire to know the truth, you have tuned in to the right broadcast, ladies and gentlemen. We give it to you raw and uncut. We don't beat around the bushes. We don't chase rabbits, but we give it to you raw and uncut. And we thank Yahweh for you tuning in with us this evening. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have been doing a series on false religions. We started with Islam. From Islam, we went to, uh, we, we addressed the Mormon uh, church, uh, the Jehovah Witness. Now we are dealing uh, with the Seventh-day Adventist church, ladies and gentlemen. And we just started this series on Friday, and it was very enlightening, very insightful. We, we, we thank Yahweh for the knowledge that he's given us, to, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And so we're going to, amen, continue with this series on the Seventh-day Adventist, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> the information that I am going to share with you today, you will not get this information from your Seventh-day Adventist church. I will advise anyone that is in the Seventh-day Adventist church at this point, or I would encourage you to look at what the Bible says. Put Ellen G. White aside for a moment and look what the Bible teaches us. If you can talk to people that have come out of the Seventh-day Adventist church, ask them why they left and see if they have anything to share with you. In 1982, an Adventist pastor, Walter T. Ray, released a book called The White Lie. It was dedicated to all those who would rather believe a bitter truth than a sweet lie. Walter T. Ray loved Ellen G. White's writings and thought that he should read what she had um, written. He began to see huge amounts of plagiarism in Ellen G. White's writing. Through diligent research, it was discovered that her supposed Inspiration from Yahweh had been borrowed from other altars without proper credit being given to the original sources. Ellen G. White's major books, including Patriarchs and Prophets, The Desire of Ages, The Spirit of Prophecy, The Great Controversy, Selected Messages, The Acts of the Apostles, Christ Object Lessons, Councils of Stewardship, Evangelism, Fundamentals of Christian Education, Gospel Workers, Message to Young People, The Ministry of Healing, My Life Today, Prophets and Kings, Sons and Daughters of God, Steps to Christ, Testimonies to the Church, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, and other books contain plagiarized materials stolen from earlier writers. One book 
sketches from the life of Paul was plagiarized in its entirety by Ellen G. White. It resulted in a lawsuit and the book was quickly taken out of print. Despite the irrefutable evidence, the Seventh-day Adventist church chose to fight back against these charges with a book titled The White Truth. In this book, their main line of defense was that since there were no copyright laws at that time, Ellen G. White had, had not actually broken the law, which of course sidestepped the issue. The book further attempt to firmly reinforce Ellen G. White's standing as a divinely inspired prophetess by stating on page 61 as saying that what we are as a church is a reflection of our faith and the divine authority evidenced in the writings of Ellen G. White. Yet, the Seventh-day Adventist hierarchy has been unable to respond to the challenge to prove that even 20% of Ellen G. White's writings were original. Equally as shaky were the visions she claimed to have from Yahweh. As I said in my previous broadcast, this woman had more visions, ladies and gentlemen, than the founder of the Jehovah Witness and his second-hand man, uh, uh, second man in charge, ladies and gentlemen. Charles Taze Russell was the founder of the Jehovah Witness Church. Uh, Joseph Rutherford was his second in command. After the death of Charles Taze Russell, uh, Joseph Rutherford took over for uh, the Jehovah Witness Church. She had more visions, ladies and gentlemen, more prophetic utterance, more false prophetic utterance than Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon church, ladies and gentlemen. Equally as shaky were the visions she claimed to have from Yahweh. Some of these visions turned out to be nothing more than verbal descriptions of paintings and drawings that she had seen in previous published books by other authors. Dan Snyder followed in his father's footsteps by becoming a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. His examination of Ellen G. White's teaching caused him to eventually lead the Seventh-day Adventist and enter another ministry. Researchers examining the early documents containing Ellen G. White's advice on diet and health are usually in for a rude awakening. We must concede that she was after all a Victorian lady with very reserved ideas on the opposite sex. Most of Ellen G. White's health advice had to do with bringing into submission the male sexual appetites, which she considered excessive. Her belief was that these sexual appetites could be controlled by diet. <laughs> she gave a list of foods to avoid, mince pies, cakes, pres uh, preserves, and seasoned meats with gravies, create a feverish condition in the system and inf inflame the animal passion dispense with animal foods and use grains, vegetables, and fruits as articles of diet. Many people believe that the vegetarian lifestyle of Seventh-day Adventism is a healthy alternative and many people are drawn to uh, Seventh-day Adventism because of their health message. Seventh-day Adventists are taught that they had a special message and that their prophetess, false prophetess, Ellen G. White, was years ahead of her time. The Bible teaches contrast to Ellen G. White's vegetarian concept. 
1 Timothy 4 and 3, Apostle Paul wrote, Listen carefully. Forbidding to marry and commanded to abstain from meats which Elohim hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. And 1 Timothy 4 and 1, Apostle Paul wrote, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Ladies and gentlemen, doctrines of devils. Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 4 and 3 mentioned two doctrines of devils. Number one, forbidding to marry. And number two, abstaining from meats. Meats are allowed for human consumption if the animal have not been strangled. And if the meat is thoroughly cooked, and if the meat is not unclean, according to Deuteronomy chapter 14 and Leviticus chapter number 11. To bring under control the male's sexual appetite, besides being vegetarians, it was advised by Ellen G. White that men, listen to this, that men should not eat an evening meal at all. Women were not immune from Ellen G. White's health advice either, and she uh, further controlled her female followers. Let me stop here. Now we see, ladies and gentlemen, I read it in the scripture, uh, 1 Timothy 4 and 3, uh, forbidden to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which Yahweh have made good. Now, for people to try to impose a vegetarian diet on you is not biblical. We see all through the scriptures that Yahweh's people ate clean food. They did not eat food that was prohibited, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for us to eat. But we can see they ate plenty of goat. They ate lamb, ladies and gentlemen. They ate oxen and other uh, of uh, clean animals, ladies and gentlemen. And this lady taught that we should abstain from meats and just become a vegetarian, ladies and gentlemen. We see the teachings of Paul and the others, ladies and gentlemen. We see that they ate meat. We see that the apostles ate meat. Yahushua himself ate meat. He ate fish, ladies and gentlemen. We see where he brought fish and for him and his disciples and ate him, ladies and gentlemen. But the Bible says that the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So, Ellen G. White taught that men should not eat any evening meal at all. He shouldn't eat any meal during the evening time. Women were not immune from Ellen G. White's health advice either, and she further controlled her female followers by issuing directives on their hairstyles and manner of dress. Ellen G. White tried to force a hot, uncomfortable, strange style of dress on her female followers. She claimed it was designed by Yahweh. And was in reality, it was in reality, ladies and gentlemen, a pair of trousers or pants with a bulky dress over top of them that went over the knees. Ellen G. White wrote, God would now have his people to adopt the reform dress, not only to distinguish them from the world, as, as her peculiar, as his peculiar people, but because a reform in dress is essential to physical and mental health. Faithful sisters struggle with the cumbersome dress until Ellen G. White quietly stopped wearing her hers some years later with no explanation given. 
when some zealous Adventist women tried to restore the wearing of the garment, believing it was Yahweh's will, Ellen G. White rebuked them. Ellen G. White wrote, God would now have his people adopt the reform dress code. Why would Yahweh give Seventh-day Adventist women the commandment to adopt the reform dress, then later change his mind? The control of Ellen G. White over her followers continued to grow tremendously, in particular when she announced those who were not following her dietary order would be left behind at the second coming of Jesus Christ. She said, Jesus Christ, we know his true name is Yahushua Mashiach. Ellen G. White taught that her followers should be vegetarians, especially in consideration of the soon return of Jesus Christ. Because if they were not vegetarians, when Jesus came, that they would not go to be with him when he comes to gather his people. Mark Martin is a former Seventh-day Adventist pastor who resigned after being forced by the Adventist authorities to choose between the teachings of Ellen G. White and the Bible. The Seventh-day Adventists do not teach the biblical doctrine of hell. They don't preach hell, just like the Jehovah Witness, ladies and gentlemen. They have very similar, amen, teachings. One of the primary distinctives of the Seventh-day Adventists is the keeping of the Saturday Sabbath. To keep the seventh day as seen as a mark of true loyalty to Yahweh. The Seventh-day Adventists got this right. They got this right, ladies and gentlemen. The seventh day should be observed by all Yahushua's followers today because it is the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The idea of the Seventh-day Sabbath was not original to Ellen G. White. It was not original to Ellen G. White. It was, in fact, Initiate, initiated by a Seventh-day Baptist contact named Joseph Bates. Joseph Bates, who subsequent, uh, subsequently taught James and Ellen White, her husband, James, and Ellen White into the idea in 1846. Ellen G. White Obliged by conveniently having a vision. This lady had more visions than, than anybody I have ever. She had more visions than Apostle Paul. She had more visions than the prophets of old. She had more visions, ladies and gentlemen, than John the Revelator. And this introduced the teaching to her followers. Conveniently having a vision. She said she had a vision, but she was taught this. She, she lied. And this introduced the teaching to her followers. But she had no vision. She was taught by the seventh day Sabbath by Joseph Bates. She was taught the seventh day Sabbath by Joseph Bates, a Sabbath day Baptist preacher. Alan G. White wrote, I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers. In the early years, when the Sabbath observance was kept, it always began at 6 p.m. on Fridays. It was before sunset in the summer and after some sunset in the winter. This went on for over nine years. Now remember she said Yahweh gave her this in a vision. If Yahweh gave her the Sabbath in, the, in a vision, wouldn't Yahweh show her how to observe it correctly? This went on for over nine years. The Bible teaches us something different.
The Bible says that the Sabbath was to be kept from sunset to sunset. A division arose among Ellen G. White's followers. The matter was studied and presented to the Seventh-day Adventist Conference in 1855. Finally, they voted to keep the Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, which is correct. There was still this dissent, however, among the Adventist followers. Alan G. White decided to have another vision to settle the matter. So she had another vision, ladies and gentlemen, to settle this matter. A delegate to the conference reported that after the conference, November the 20th, the vision was given establishing those undecided on the sunset time. Far from the convenient Fake vision establishing the matter. The Adventists continued to ask questions. Why could they not believe Ellen G. White's original visions concerning the 6 o'clock p.m. Sabbath? Why the change now? Nine years later, had they not been in fact Sabbath breakers and not Sabbath keepers for the first nine years of the practice, it required another fake vision by Ellen G. White and which she promised to question the angel <laughs> and get an explanation to cause the controversy to die down. Ellen G. White wrote, I inquire why it had been thus that at this late date, we must change the time of commencing the Sabbath. Listen to this. Said the angel. She said the angel told her, ladies and gentlemen, she shall understand, ye shall understand, but not yet, not yet. Alan G. White died without ever giving the promised explanation from Yahweh. However, the keeping of the Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday came to be of prime importance and determining who will receive the seal of God and be sealed and who would not. But I must clarify, ladies and gentlemen, the observance of the seventh day Sabbath from, from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday is biblically Correct. Even false religions can have elements of truth. This is how Satan deceived many. He present truth to draw them, then he entrap them with heresies. The Seventh day Adventists wrongly teach that Sunday worship is the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is not Sunday worship, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible tells us. The mark of the beast, ladies and gentlemen, will be a mark in our forehead and our hand. It will be a um, uh, uh, silicon microchip technology, ladies and gentlemen. Though Sunday is not Yahweh's designated day of worship, Sunday worship is not the mark of the beast. Seventh-day Adventists deviate in their salvation doctrine by teaching that Satan, listen to this false teaching, that Satan ultimately becomes a sin bearer. They teach that Satan bears away the sins of the world. Ellen G. White wrote, as the priest in removing the sins from the sanctuary, confess them upon the head of the scapegoat. So Christ will place all these sins upon Satan, the originator and instigator of sin. How different this is from the Bible, which says of Yahoshua Mashiach that he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, 1 Peter 2 and 24. John the Baptist exclaimed in John 1 and 29, Behold, the Lamb of Elohim, which, which taketh 
away the sins of the world. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 declares, For he have made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Elohim in him. Satan did not bear our sins, ladies and gentlemen. Yahushua bore our sins on the cross in his body. Steve Cannon, Southwest Director of Personal Freedom Outreach, a highly respected cult research ministry, has examined the question of whether Seventh-day Adventism should be classified as a cult. He said today, Seventh-day Adventists strive to be included as mainline evangelical Protestants and therefore object very strongly to any hint that they may be teaching cultic doctrines. Any Adventist pastor applied, I'm sorry, an Adventist pastor applied the following, five marks of a cult. Now, this is a, a seven day Adventist pastor. Now, you be the judge, or whether or not that his denomination fits his own definition of a cult. Point number one cults, cults, or false religions usually have a single powerful human leader who becomes the cult messiah who can can deny the total reliance of the group on the teachings of Ellen G. White. She may not be called their Messiah, but is certainly their messenger of Yahweh, revered by all. Point number two, the cult leaders, word or teachings of the occult, of the cult becomes absolute truth overshadowing the teachings of the Bible. No Seventh-day Adventist would dare deny that Ellen G. White's comments on a certain portion of scripture determine the group's acceptance or rejection of historical views held on those scriptures. Ellen G. White's interpretation prevail and become Adventist Doctrine, even today, her writings are considered to be of equal inspiration with biblical scripture. Point number three, each cult uses pressure tactics to coerce members into submission. Alan G. White knew how to pressure people into submission. First, she would claim to receive a reproof from Yahweh for the person, which she would air publicly through her testimonies. Usually, the person conform under the pressure. She wrote, I have uttered reproofs because the Lord has given me words of reproof, reproof for the church. The tactics may not be as blatant today, but believers are subject to pressure tactics today as well as, as well to conform to the group. Love, ac acceptance, and fellowship are very often withheld from anyone who questions the official teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Point number four, each cult denies the central truth of the gospel that Yahoshua is the divine son of Elohim without beginning or ending. They deny that his death was provided salvation for the entire human race. As a result, salvation is earned by adherence to the teachings of the cult, rather accepting the Messiah and following him. I want to point out that the group originally denied the deity of Yahushua Mashiach. Today, they believe that Yahushua Mashiach is eternal, but they are stuck with the old doctrine that Yahushua is the archangel Michael. 
They need to firmly establish one doctrine and discontinue the other. However, they cannot give up this doctrine which contradicts Hebrews 1 and 13 without having to acknowledge that Ellen G. White made many mistakes. Instead, they tried to accommodate both conflicting doctrines. This is an impossible situation. Ellen G. White taught that Yahushua will cease to be humanity's mediator. This theology is absolutely wrong. Ellen G. White wrote, those who are living upon the earth when the intersection of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above or to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Contrast this with the plain statement from the Bible in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 concerning Yahushua Mashiach. It declares, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to Elohim by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercessions for them. Truly, the salvation for the seventh day Adventists placing sin upon Satan is not the salvation taught in the Bible. Point number five. Cults often urge their converts to leave their families, cut them off completely. At last, we can find a point on which we can agree. Adventists did not urge their converts to leave their families. That means out of the five points marking a group as a cult, four of them applies to Seventh-day Adventists. Many feel this is to, to the cult like for them. This rather many feel this is too much like a cult for them. During 1950s, certain well-known evangelical Christian ministries approached the Seventh-day Adventist hierarchy in an affair effort to find out the true nature of their doctrinal belief in a gesture similar to the Mormons. The Adventist leaders designed the approval of the Christian community at large, deceptively espouse the evangelical view of salvation by grace alone. While this temporarily pacified many Christians denominations. It wrecked heavy within Seventh-day Adventism. Many followers felt betrayed and began searching the teachings of Ellen G. White for themselves. In an effort to discover the truth, those who did, did were shocked what they found. What began for many as a quest to validate Ellen G. White, ladies and gentlemen, and Adventism turned instead to a shocking discovery of the plagiarism, false prophecies, and heretical teachings of Ellen G. White, ladies and gentlemen. Glory to Yahweh. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when she was a child at the age of nine, she got hit in the head by a rock. This incident, ladies and gentlemen, must did a lot of damage to her, ladies and gentlemen, because, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the false prophecies, the many, many visions that this woman said that she had, her teachings, ladies and gentlemen, her, her radical teachings, ladies and gentlemen, prove that something mentally was wrong with this woman beside entertaining demonic spirits. 
First Timothy 4 and 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, and we are in the latter times, the end times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Like the Mormons, the Jehovah Witness, ladies and gentlemen, and other cultic groups, ladies and gentlemen, they teach doctrines of devils, doctrines and commandments of men that is not biblical, that is not biblical sound. Paul told Timothy in my closing, in 2 uh, Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, he told this young pastor, he said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrines. For the times will come, and we are in those times, the end times, where they would not endure sound doctrine, but heap after their own lust, teachers having itching ears, and they would turn their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. The word of Yahweh say fables. What is a fable? Fable is something, ladies and gentlemen, fictitious, a, 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 a fairy tale, a folk's tale, ladies and gentlemen, glory to Yahweh, a lie, fallacies, and this is what people are hearing to in these end times, fallacies, ladies and gentlemen, false teachings, people don't want the truth. Scriptures say they will not endure sound doctrine, but they will deviate from the word of Yahweh and get caught up into seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we thank Yahweh for you tuning in with us once again with another message from the word of Yahweh. Yahweh. We are going to continue this series. I have at least two more series, too much, two uh, more, amen, teachings in this series. So we want you to continue to listen to us. Our Facebook friends will be coming on tomorrow, amen, at the same time. To all our Facebook, uh, YouTube friends, subscribe. Uh, send your likes, your thumbs ups, and we will really appreciate it tremendously. Until next time, may Yahweh continue to bless you is our prayers.